Making A Club Champion listeners, thank you again so much for tuning in to another episode. I hope this all finds you well. I think this is going to be the last episode for 2018. I really enjoyed as ever bringing you and featuring you new guests once a month um in this new episode i think we're going to try and do a different slightly format and i'm going to do an experience based podcast so i've been very fortunate enough for the last couple of years to have caddied at the european q school finals over in spain and I'm going to basically share all of my lessons and notes from the last three years of being a caddy on the European tour at the Q School finals. So I split this episode into three sections, before, during and after. So in brief, in this episode, you will learn some of the following. Before, all of the preparation that's involved for you getting your first gig of being a caddy and how to become a caddy on the European tour during the best tactics and advice that I learned whilst caddying. After, how the players spend their downtime, my observations of guys on tour, and some of the best tactics I have learned which you can implement in your own game. I'll chuck a couple of stories and analogies in between, and if you have any questions on any of the things I've said or you want me to discuss in further detail, feel free to reach out to me. Um, my email is makingaclubchampion at gmail.com or you can find me on the website makingaclubchampion.com and just ping me a, a, a specific question you had about the, the podcast episode and I can go into it in further detail if you have any questions. Okay, so let's jump straight in. Uh, So this section is the before section, so you will learn some of the following. How I got my first gig whilst caddying, uh, what is Q-School and how someone gets their tour card on the European tour, agreeing terms of your contract and your first gig as a caddy, how to prepare and practice uh, during the practice rounds and some of the things you can pick up and take, you know, observe and and what the, the players take notes of during the round. Uh, what are the principles and lessons I learned from my first experience? And then I may chuck a couple of stories uh, further down the line. Okay, so let's go into how I got my first gig. So I'm going to say you're probably going to get your first opportunity one of three ways. One is that you are a sort of experienced golfer yourself. You know, you could be, uh, you know, at your golf club mixing amongst some some very good players who are sort of giving golf a shot in terms of a career or it could be the club pro who's who's got a wealth of experience and always always pitching up to Q school uh, the other the other option is is that, is that you are a current caddy you've got a 20 plus years of wealth of experience behind your your back and your name sort of circulates amongst players week in week out and you've really earned your 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 experience uh through caddying having put been there and done all the work and the last one is that perhaps you you may not even be a golfer at all and you know but you just have a a, a real enthusiasm for the game and you want to learn more about caddying and you could see yourselves as as becoming a caddy and being um involved in the game through through that angle rather than an actual player yourself so I, I got my first opportunity the, the first way. I was a college golfer in America. I played at North Carolina. And at the rival college uh, was a chap called Pete Tarver jones And we've actually featured Pete on the podcast. I think he's around episode five or four, I believe. And it's a really fascinating uh, interview. And we actually touch on a little bit of caddying in, the, in there as well, if you wanted to look up that in further detail. But... I noticed that Pete was getting better year on year at college in America and, you know, he was competing uh, week in, week out at tournaments from the East Coast all the way down to Florida. And then by the time he got to his final year, he was actually, you know, competing against national championships and he was he really took his game to the next level. And college golf is a fantastic indicator if you have the game or not. You are playing on PGA Tour standard venues you're like the PGA National down in Florida and you're competing against some of the best golfers in the world uh, at sort of junior level so if you can win there then you I would say you've got every ability to go and win um, certainly on Euro Pro Tour and then compete in, in Challenge Tour and then go on you know to try and earn your your tour card on the European Tour so 
uh, I think Pete had actually won the Euro Pro Tour final over at Desert Springs, which made, I think, enabled him to get a second uh, stage start at the Q School. So I think I reached out to Pete on, on Facebook. And I think this is a fantastic way of getting your foot in the door. Um, with with everyone being so connected uh, online these days, you can, if, if there's a golfer you, you like the, the look of, perhaps it would be on the Euro Pro Tour or Challenge Tour, I would probably recommend starting off from those levels first if you have no experience um, to, to learn the ropes. But keep an eye on certain players, the players that can that can go low on the weekends or the ones that are, are moving up the, the order of merit quickly week on, week out. And then what I would do is I would find their their name and then look them up on the different mediums. So look them up on Facebook, look them up on Instagram, look them up on Twitter, see if they're online or that they have a presence or maybe even a personal website and then go to their contact stage and then just shoot them a message and say, hey, uh, in this case, we could use Pete as an example. Hey, Pete, notice you're you're doing really well. And again, be open and honest. I don't have much experience in terms of being a caddy, but I'd really love to learn the ropes. If you have any opportunities that are coming up, uh, just let me know. I'd love to be there for you and um, just keep me in the loop. And I would just leave it as simple and open and honest as that. And then once you've got your experience under your belt, you can then shoot up to the bigger names, perhaps on the Challenge Tour, uh, get your get some rounds under your belt working with some 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 bigger names who are competing maybe for some more prize money and then once you've got that on your belt then perhaps you could go all the way into the you know the the final stage of caddying for you know people on the european tour but caddying is an art and it is a skill and i think as as you listen to this podcast there'll be uh lots you can take away from this which will help uh maybe fast track you uh in terms of the caddying process So I I did exactly that. I just reached out to Pete over Facebook and I said, hey, Pete, notice you're over in the Q school um, in in Spain. If if you need a caddy, let me know and I'll be there for you. Pete very kindly got back to me, uh, I think that day and said, hey, man, would absolutely love to have you there. Um, Didn't have a caddy for the week, was just going to carry my bag. That's what most people do at the Q school. Um, I'd say it's probably 50-50 split or probably 60-40 fit. 60-40 60-40 split of people carrying their bags and people having caddies and I, I think it's a long week so I think it's it's well advised that people do take caddies at the end of the day and um, uh, before you know it Pete had very kindly offered to to pay for my flights to go out and my accommodation and then as I didn't have little you know had little experience I was going to do the work uh, for him for free and hey, it's a fantastic opportunity to go out to Spain and witness something um, like the European Tour, you know, Q School. I've, I think it's a complete win-win and I wouldn't I wouldn't ask for any anything to begin with to get your foot in the door. See it as more of like an internship rather than, you know, you're being employed to begin with. Okay, so what is uh, Q School and what is, you know, how does someone get their, their tour card? So the 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 Q school is a very is quite a complicated format, and basically, in in simple terms, it is made up of three stages. Uh, the first stage there is um, venues held all around Europe, and roughly eight hundred people pay around about eighteen hundred pounds each. So it's a, it's a lot of money to enter the first stage, and I think anyone can go for it if you're scratch and below, as an even even an amateur. And you'll be allocated a venue around Europe. Um, to get through that stage, you've got to finish in the top 20%, which is roughly around about 23 to 25 spaces. You'll be then moved into the second stage. And those will be allocated at four venues over in Spain. Um, once you, If you get through that stage, again, it'll be the top 20%, around about 23 places at each venue you'll be then moved to the final stage once you get to the final stage you've got to then play six rounds of golf but there is a four round cut so you've got to make that four round cut to play the last two rounds if you play the last two rounds uh, you automatically get a challenge tour card and then it's the top 25 after all of those six rounds who get their European tour card. And there's a whole category system by the time you get your, if if you're in the top 25. So actually you really want to finish 
as high as you can. You almost want to win it, especially in that you want to be in the top 10 to get you all of the starts uh, on the European tour schedule. So that's basically how someone gets a job on the European tour as a player and go through the whole ranks. So it's an it's incredibly long week. Um, and, you know, if you can play all the way through from stage one to the final stage, then you, you're probably a good enough player to earn your way on the European tour. And, you know, even someone like Sam Horsfield last year did exactly that. And Jonathan Thompson, we've had Jonathan Thompson on the show as well. I think he's episode 16 or something. Um, and, you know, those those kind of players earned their card from stage one all the way through to the final stage against some of the best golfers in the world. So it's it's a it's a long run, but it, it certainly determines what kind of player you are. So when it in terms of agreeing your contract, I think I sort of just touched on this. Uh, I I would just to get your foot in the door to begin with, I would certainly uh, work for free and do it as more of an internship. And then, you know, the player's always going to sort of reward you if if you're if you're giving back to him, you know, maybe flights to a, a certain venue around Europe, or it could be, uh, you know, room and board uh, at the villa or hotel that where they're staying at. And, uh, you know, lots of players sort of piggyback with one another and they sort of split and share accommodation. So the first time I I went to Spain. We stayed with a chap called Joe Dean and his girlfriend, Emily, who I've gotten to know well over the last couple of years. And, you know, you get to meet other people and other professional golfers. You're, you're really in, the, in, in amongst uh, some really good golfers if you, if you can just get your foot in the door. And I think if you can sort of follow the steps and strategies I just listed above, I think it will, it will serve you well in the long run. Okay, so... How to prepare and um, during the practice rounds, what are the things that one one does and what, what, what do the players look out for? So the week usually starts off when a, a player would usually get to, I'd say, the venue around about a Tuesday and you've got sort of a, a Tuesday. You know, players normally would take it very lightly. On the first day they arrive, they may just head to the range, do some putting work, find the, the speed of the greens, maybe go out for nine holes. It, it depends entirely of what the player you've got with likes to do. And I think that's the, the thing of what caddying is, is that you're accompanying your player, you're not sort of directing him. Most of these golfers would know exactly what 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 they like and uh you know, what they do well. So they're very meticulous about the way they do things. You know, they, they've practiced for 10, 15, 20 years. So they're, they're very routined and they like things done in certain ways. So you are just going, I would say, along for the ride, but you're trying to accompany them and give them as much value and help for when they're trying to achieve their objective for that given week. Um, so, you know, little things could be, you're taking note of, you know, where would they want to lay up on a, a given par five if they need to lay up? Where are the flat spots on the fairway to give themselves the perfect yardage coming into a par five? Um, what, what what areas of the greens they want to hit it in? What area of the greens they don't want to hit in? What what's a bad side to miss the, on you know on an approach shot to a given green? What's a good side to miss on approach shot if they're going to miss a green? Um, and they, you know, they, they may put that in their, in their course planners and highlight areas they want to hit into in, in one color and then highlight other areas they don't want to hit to in another color. And you can learn all of this by just asking questions and, you know, perhaps the player may do this all by himself and he just wants someone to talk down, uh, down the fairways with to keep his mind, you know, little, just, just not on golf 24 seven. Um, other things you could do are, um, when you're playing practice rounds, there'll be there'll be little dots that are recorded on the putting green, and you could put out a golf ball uh, on these dots, as these would be the pin placements for the four days. Uh, if you're a really experienced caddy, or I've seen some people do, they actually have little discs. So they have like a, a yellow disc for the first day, a green disc for the second day, and a red disc for the third day, and they so the player can sort of be putting to the the different holes throughout the given week. Uh, so those are just a, a couple of things uh, that players look out for on the practice rounds. Um, mainly, I would say, 
the, one of the biggest things is is how far the ball's going that given week, uh, what the wind is doing on practice days, and then looking at forecasts for what the wind is doing for the next couple of days and seeing how the ball is going to react uh, on, on a given day to how far the ball is going. And you're always taking notes during practice rounds of how far each club's going. So it could be a pitching wedge is going 120 yards, but the greens are also quite receptive. So they are spinning back, say, three yards, and you're doing that for every club to get a real feel and nature and nurture of the course. And the other thing is just obviously just finding the, the best course strategy for the given week. You know, what side of the fairways do you want to, to, to drive down? Uh, where do you want to lay up to on, on the par fives or hit into from different angles to different pins? Okay, so um, what principles and lessons I learned from my first experience? Um, let's start off with the range. So the the range is probably the, the area where, as a caddy, you are going to be somewhat of the busiest, and it's probably going to teach you a lot of uh, what you're going to be implementing throughout uh, a given round of golf. So I think I remember my first opportunity, I was just, I didn't really know what to do at all. So I was just kind of watching other caddies and learning off them. So there was a very experienced veteran caddy to the right of me, if I remember. And I was just watching what he was doing and, and just implementing the same. So when it comes to the obvious, when you get cl you're cleaning the clubs on the range, a player is going to work through his bag, usually starting from uh, wedges. And then they'll work to, you know, seven irons. They may go in evens or odds. So they may go wedges, nine iron, seven iron, and then into the longer irons, five iron, three iron, and then work through their, their bag with like fairy woods and then drivers. So your, your job at Caddy is, I think the most important thing is probably just to keep the clubs clean. And it's how you do these small things is how, you know, if you do the small things well, the big things will take care of themselves. So if you can, if you can clean a golf club, if a caddy asks you a certain opinion on a on a given shot, he's going to have trust with you because you can do the small things well. So don't overlook uh, doing something like cleaning a club as as a minor task. Um, take pride in it, and you know you can get one of those little brushes that has uh, the the copper brush and and the woolen brush and that little groove cleaner in the middle, and use that to to really I find I find can be quite helpful and. Also, just wetting a towel. Uh, it sounds obvious, but the way you wet a towel, don't, don't don't just water the whole towel. Just wet just a slight corner of it, and then and then dampen it out because you don't want that wet towel going over the golf bag and then dampening your trousers while you're walking down the fairway. Uh, it's just the little things that make a, a big difference. So as as the player is working for his bag on the range, you're obviously going to be cleaning his clubs. Um, the other thing is don't assume anything or make assumptions. Um, a player may uh, may not like his grips being clean, for example, because they have a particular feel about them. Um, so don't you'll see some caddies that are just cleaning uh, the man's grips for them, but a, a, a certain player may actually prefer them just the way they are. Um, I remember watching a guy at final stage and he was using this special spray to clean uh, his golfer's clubs. And as a player, I was just blown away by that. I was... If, if I was a player, I would want to work with a caddy like that because he's taking so much pride in his work about the little things and how much value he's going and he's doing above and beyond all of his duties to, to provide the, the player with the best service as possible. So I thought that was a nice little uh, analogy of, of, of what caddying is, is about as well. Um, the other thing you can do is you can, uh, before your man gets to the range, you can push now out all of the... The, the yardage markers out on the range. So it could be the 50 yard marker, the 100 and 150 and perhaps all the flags and, and draw them out on a, a piece of paper and write down the actual uh, numbers uh, that they are to those given distances. Because you're up and moving down the range, you, you're you going to be hitting from different angles. So that 50 yard, 50 yard marker may actually be 48 yards or it could be 53 yards. So just making a little note and then giving that to your player is another little thing you can do uh, to go above and beyond and provide a good service and value to him. Um, also, it gives him confidence because he's they all use brand new Pro Vs on the range anyway. So they're actually hitting uh, the right, right intended yardages with specific golf clubs to, um, you know, specific yardages on the on the on the on the driving range. So they're going to feel very confident then going onto the course and replicating those same shots. 
Okay, other things you can do is get the bag ready before you head out onto the first tee. Usually around the first tee or 10th tee or around the clubhouse, there'll be a big bucket of water and perhaps a box filled with fruits, apples, or maybe some nuts. It's stocking up the bag and have this all ready before you're ready to go. So grab a cup, usually I'd say two bottles for your player and then perhaps two bottles for yourself or one bottle. Uh, the other thing I found helpful was last week is that I would actually drink both bottles myself uh, before we'd head out to the first tee. So I wasn't lugging around that extra weight for me. Uh, in the past, I used to put my water bottles in a different pocket within the bag or perhaps just take off a label so they so I knew which ones were mine and which ones were the players but I think uh, the 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 tactic of actually just um, just necking two bottles of water before you tee off and then when by the time you get to the 10th tee you can do exactly the same and neck another two uh, there and then you that should be enough to to get you through a round of golf uh, if the player likes electrolytes in one of his bottles of water making sure that uh, that's being put in uh, before you get to the first tee, so you're not sort of adding these tablets down the fairway. Um, okay, what else have we've got? Um, I think that's that's it for all that section. But what 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 you'll start to learn is that you you've got to be very prepared as Ked, and you're always thinking of the next shot when you get onto the the course. Um, you know, if you're in the middle of the fairway, you've got to as soon as the your player hits the ball. Uh, he's going to already be walking down the fairway. You've got to get the divot, clean it, uh, put it back, put the golf club back in the bag, clean the club, and then get to his ball uh, and do the yard, the next yardage, or be prepared, uh, all in the, you know in a very short space of time. So always be thinking and of the what's going on next, rather than actually being present or be stuck in the in the past way of thinking. Okay, um, emotions the night before tournament starts. So I, I found this quite interesting. I, I asked, I asked Pete on the first experience he had at Q School. I said, well, you know, what what is your emotions before before you start tomorrow? Because as a player myself, I used to absolutely dread the moments before and leading up to a, a tournament. Uh, so I asked, I asked Pete. I said, you know, what what are you feeling? And he said, well. I, I, I'm feeling actually a lot, a lot of the same. I'm feeling very nervous and very sort of anxious of what's going to happen. But it's how I interpret those emotions is, is how it's going to affect my performance and, and not letting them get the better of me and actually using it as an advantage. This, you know, these nerves are exciting and uh, I, I take them in as something of pride and value because I care of what I'm doing. So how you interpret those feelings and uh, before a given competition is something you can control of and it's just the story in which you tell yourself. And I'll touch on another story. I was very fortunate enough to go to the Rolex um, series event at Wentworth this year and I watched Matt Wallace for the first three days and Matt was right on the cut mark around about it was day two and he got to the 18th hole and I don't know if you uh, have, have watched Wentworth event it's a fantastic venue and the 18th hole was this big par five round to the right with out of bounds right out of bounds left and you most players sort of lay up as players as a free shotter uh, with Matt right on the cut mark, I'd imagine he was going to do the same. But when he approached the 18th um, tee, he, he put his tee peg in the ground and then automatically reached out his driver and then just launched one, a big high draw over the outer bounds and then put him right in the middle of the fairway. And I, I thought, well, that's very interesting because as being right on the cut mark, he must have told himself a very interesting dialogue or internal story uh, before he hit that golf ball and it would have been all of confidence you know let's let's not let let's let's get it down there let's put it on the green for two and let's try and make eagle get birdie uh, at the very most and we'll move up the the scoreboard as fast as we can matt wasn't playing from fear he wasn't playing from nerves he was playing there to win and then move up uh the the, the leaderboard as quickly as he can so be you know if 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 you are nervous before you play golf, have a look at that internal story which you're telling yourself. And a good thing to do is actually write it down or in a journal. Uh, even if you're playing on a round of golf, you know you, the first tee shot, you could recall all of your emotions and stories or 
uh, words you were saying to yourself, like don't duff it, don't hit it out of bounds or don't muck this up. Um, you can change that story. That's they're just the words you're telling yourself. Instead of it should be, let's hit a nice high power draw over the bunkers in the middle of the fairway and give ourselves the best opportunity to make birdie down the first. So that internal dialogue of what you talk to yourself is what some of the best players in the world are very good at and are very effective at. Okay, so to wrap things up in this first section, how to be a caddy on the European tour, uh, I'll sort of sh share it as like an analogy of... Um, of something I experienced recently. So I was trying, um, I was trying to get back home the other night and I was stuck at a, a, a bridge in, in Bristol, in Clifton. And we've got this beautiful bridge called the Clifton Suspension Bridge. It was designed by Brunel. And I approached this toll booth and uh, it's one pound to get to the other side. And I was digging around. I thought I had this pound coin in my car, but I couldn't find it anywhere. And what happened was, was that a car um, was was stuck behind me and then I started to build up this traffic jam uh, all the way back and I was causing havoc. I was having a bad day anyway and I was giving even more annoyed because I thought that the car behind me was going to start beeping his horn and then we were all going to get in this sort of big argument. And what happened was, was that the car behind me, actually he got out um, didn't raise his voice, didn't slam on his horn, just came up and said, don't worry, mate, I've got you. And then just put a pound in the, in the, in the, in the toll booth. And I was on my way across the bridge. And then he happened to get on his way. And what the analogy of this story is, 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 is a quote. And I think it's, it, it's this. So it's, if you give people what they want, you will get what you want. So in this instance, I wanted to get across the bridge, but I couldn't get across the bridge. The guy behind me wanted to get across the bridge, but he couldn't get across the bridge because I was in front of him. So for him to get what he wanted was to get over the bridge and get home. He gave me what I wanted or what I needed to get over. And so he gave me a pound coin uh, and then we both happened to get home and to our end destination. And actually, I thought is a, a wonderful sort of analogy of what caddying is about. And um, in, in, in that instance, I was having a bad day anyway. So when I was traveling across the bridge, I was thinking, oh, what a kind gesture it was of that man to help me. Um, and it turned my day around. And, and it obviously would have turned his, his day around as well because he gave a kind gesture. And I'm sure he felt good about himself as well. So we actually both went across the bridge and I'm sure in a very, in a winning moment. So caddying is, is a bit like that, is, um, is, there's another slogan of my university in North Carolina, and that was serve, don't be served. So you sacrificing what perhaps you need or want um, to get your player what he wants. And if, if you're always serving your player and looking after him in a great way, um, he's going to climb up the leaderboard better. He's going to feel more comfortable around you. He's going to do well over the course of a season. He's going to win more money. That means you win more money. He's going to get his tour card. That means you get to travel around the world with him. Uh, so the better you serve your your player or man, the, the, the more exciting and more fun it's going to be for you. And I think that's exactly what caddying is all about. So I'm going to stop here. Um, as that's quite a lot of information. I hope it was a value. And then we'll move on to the second chunk, which is all about, um, you know, what happens during a round of golf above caddying. So I hope you enjoy that first section and I'll catch you in a bit. Okay, I am back. Sadly, the coffee break didn't do any justice. I got distracted and went to the gym. I've been doing these kettlebell classes, which I've been doing about three times a week now for the last year. And it's, um, it's one of the first classes I've done where they've actually stuck for the duration of time. So if you're looking for something perhaps for the new year uh, to do, uh, I'd highly recommend group classes. Um, they seem to be very effective in the terms of being accountable to your teammates and members of turning up week in, week out. Um, these classes, you just hurl a kettlebell around for the best part of 60 minutes with a very scary and angry instructor screaming at you, which is probably also quite effective, but highly recommend it. To digress, and to digress even further, I'm currently drinking uh, some yerba mate, which is one of my favourite little beverages. I think I've touched on it before on the podcast. I always like sharing 
the things I it was experimenting with. Um, I think yerba mate is an Argentinian-based drink, and the mate is the gourd where you put the the yerba in, or maybe the other way around. And it's a sweet, sweetish, and very caffeinated tea. As you can probably tell by now, I quite like caffeine. Okay, helps with podcasts like this. Um, so in this chunk of the podcast, we are going to be talking about. Uh, the things I've learned whilst actual actually caddying, and perhaps uh, some a few little stories. Uh, my personal objective, what I try and achieve each round as being a caddy, and uh, I may touch on how one or two players I've learned do their yardage systems, which is quite interesting. So I think we'll start off with what my personal objective is whilst caddying. And the way I look at it is that I I try and save my player one shot around. And that seems probably quite minor, but over the course of a given week, that is four shots. And that is the difference between someone keeping their card on tour, uh, making the cut for a given week, and a, a lot of money, four shots. It certainly moves you up on the field. So... Uh, There's also another quote here which I found from the 15th club um, who do the analytics for the Ryder Cup team and lots of players on European tour. Quite a fascinating company if you've never heard of them. And I found this quote online on their blog which says as the following. The margins in golf are so small when you examine performance on a shot-by-shot basis. A golfer who turns one average shot into a great shot per round can transform their career on tour. Improving by that much is worth roughly around 50% in higher earnings. So a golfer expected to earn 1 million per season would be expected to earn 1.5 million per season just by improving one average shot to be a great shot. So based on my objective, I'll share a little story of how I believe I met it in one instance. So last week at the final stage... Uh, I was caddying for a chap called Matthew Perry. Matt has actually been uh, on the podcast. I think it's episode six. It's a fascinating interview. And I don't know if anyone knows more about the game than Matt, so I'd highly recommend it. I think it's called How to Optimize Performance on and Off the Golf Course. And in this instance, it was the final day, and I think we were around about 50th on on the leaderboard. And I think the top 23 in tied... I uh, got their spots to go to the final stage. So we had some work to do and we had to get off to a fast start. Luckily, Matt uh, was two under for about five holes and we got that fast start and he was in a very controlled manner about the way he was conducting his business on the golf course. Everything was very deliberate and he was just being patient and just taking the opportunities when and when they were presenting themselves. So we got to the sixth hole and Matt had a putt to go to three under. Uh, It was only three foot. He laid up on the par five and hit a wedge shot to, uh, yeah, just about three feet below the pole. And very, what would seem a given at this level, uh, he actually missed it. I think he pulled it left. And you could see him getting a little frustrated as we were walking towards the six. Um, So as we're walking towards a six, I, I was just being aware of this. I wasn't trying to say anything. It's very, this is far too early to just because he's missed a putt to, to butt in. I just let Matt keep conducting his business and going through his routine. Uh, then Matt hits a slightly, sorry, this is the seventh hole, hits a slightly wayward tee shot into a bunker and we, we luckily get away with a par. Uh, he finds the back of the green and gives himself a very tricky two putt, but he makes the two putt and walks on towards the eighth hole, which is a long 240 yard par three. And I, I could somewhat see that Matt is, is his speed is just a little little quicker. He's just walking around the golf course, uh, not quite as slowly and deliberately as he was the first uh, four holes. But there's a little his pace is just turned up a little bit, and you could see that his eye movement is is he's moving. He's looking around the golf course a little more, um, getting a little distracted. So I'm just I'm just making notes of this mental notes in my head and just being aware of what's going on. So the eight four is 240 yard par three. Anything that finds the green is a great outcome, I would say personally. 
Um, he hits a free iron right over the back of, uh, right over the flag, and it rolls towards the very back of the green, leaving him about a 35, 40 foot putt, which Matt finds uh, quite frustrating and sort of brings the club back to the bag, sort of slams it in, and you could see him sort of huffing and puffing. But again, I'm, there's no damage done. There's no reason for me to sort of butt in. And, you know, this is not a time for me to, to add value. He's, he's still going along okay. He's not hit a terrible shot. But I am just getting, you know, it's just adding to the, the tally of, of mental notes that I'm observing of Matt on the golf course. He makes a very good two putt and hits the first putt down to about five, six feet and then makes the one coming back for his par. And I think we still have the honour going on to the 18th tee, which is a uh, a sort of longish par five, and which should be bread and butter for Matt. Matt is one of the, the best ball strikers I have ever seen and played with. He's sort of 320 plus off the tee. So these most of these par fives are, are merely just long par fours for Matt. And he puts the ball onto his tee and this time he's rushing through his process there is there's not much of a routine and stands over the ball a little quicker than normal and hits a quick snap hook on this occasion and but gets away with it and it lands short of the bunker uh, but in the rough um, so now I think that there is something which is going on so now it's maybe a good time uh, walking towards his ball for me to say something and I think I I read about this somewhere where Eleanor Roosevelt would ask three questions um, before taking a meeting with another president. And he would always ask the other president, he would say, have you eaten yet? Uh, have you had a good night's sleep or have you been drinking? Of course, I've been with Matt for the last 24 hours, so I knew he wasn't drinking or, you know, I know he had a good night's sleep because I asked him in the morning. So I asked him just to make sure he was thinking clearly before I butted in and, and, and provided some value. Uh, you know, have, have you eaten um, anything recently? Or, you know, would you like some, some bananas or some nutrition or some fluids? And he said, no, I'm fine. So I thought now is a good time. And I just said to him in a very precise uh, manner. And I said, Matt, you're, you're getting a little quick. Let's get you back to uh, thinking clearly and presently and how you were conducting your way about your business on the first four holes. And then Matt actually came back to me and said, oh, I, I didn't realise that. I thought I was, you know, I thought I was actually taking too too long over the shots. And I was like, no, you're, you're, you're getting quicker and quicker. Let's go back to your process and take your time. Don't worry about other people, you know, us being slow. If, if there's a problem, I'll deal with it. Um, so let's go back to conducting the process and the routine and making some good decisions here on in. So Matt had to lay up the second shot uh, to the par five because there's, there's no way we could go for it in two. It was a tricky downhill lie, water all down the right, bunkers down the left, had to hit a good seven iron to lay up in the perfect position. And the way he went about his this business, you know, he walked up to the spot, looked through the yardage books, was very, very thorough and hit a very smooth tempo like swing. And I could see that that fully hit Matt and his way of thinking. And he then went on to par the hole. And then actually we bogeyed the first uh, because we we're playing from the 10th hole and which is probably the hardest golf hole on the on the on the whole golf course. But I could tell it didn't affect him and he was still carrying a very present thought and he went on to the second hole and he birdied two, three and I think eight and all the rest were pars. So I think that's a good instance or example of how you can interrupt uh, a pattern or someone's emotions and sort of turn it into a positive and I, I can probably safely say on that instance, we saved Matt uh, a shot on that round of golf um, from turning something that was getting out of his, the round was getting out of his control to bringing it back into his control, making him aware of um, the given situation. Um, so based on a more notes like that, um, there are some other things which I think you can, which I've learned to implement over the years. And that is like the language you use. So 
throughout the round or the, the course of the round, you're going to be talking to your player. You you know you're going to say things like "good shot," um, uh, you know, "great swing," but that that's not really probably an effective use of language. Uh, imagine these these guys have been hitting great shots or good shots for since they were five years old. That's that that language is not going to pierce through their their brain. It's just gonna it's just going to disappear. It's like going up to a girl in a bar saying, hey, how are you? Like They've heard it a thousand times. It's, it's not very effective. So what you want to do is is be very specific with the language you do use. And I'll tell you another story. So the first, the day one and whole one of this, this season's Q School, um, I could tell that Matt was very nervous standing on the tee and... Uh, you know, as he should be, and, and and I'm sure everyone else was. Uh, that the first hole of of Q school is not um, exactly uh, the most exciting of times. It's probably more nervous of times, especially the first hole. This course in Las Colinas was a very very tough hole, and I could see that his his sort of rhythm was slightly off. And we luckily got away with uh, a very very good par making up and down after hitting two balls for his second shot because we thought we lost one and we walked off with a par. And I said to him as he was walking to the second, uh, now you can you can let it go uh, and stop worrying about the outcome. Now, he's probably never heard that phrase or those words. Um, I don't know, it could be forever or, you know, for a very long time. So I knew that was going to pierce and hit him walking towards the second hole. And I remember him saying after when we got into the clubhouse that he, for the rest of the round, he, he really didn't care about the outcome of that round and he was just going to go out there and play golf. So be very um, deliberate about the use of language and words you use and um, get specific of what you're saying to your player. Things like good shot is is, is not going to work. Um, what else? Um, okay, so... You, I think a lot of it is is developing these very ritual and routines uh, with your player. So I think I learned this actually from Oscar Sharp back in the day. Um, I was I was very lucky enough to play against Oscar. I think he's, I forgot what episode we featured him on the podcast before as well. But Oscar was one of the best players growing up, and I always remember him having these deliberate routines throughout his round of golf. So he would always eat a banana on free. On the third tee box, the sixth tee box, the ninth tee box, and the twelfth tee box, just like a little bit of a banana in each one. He'd always be drinking water as he left the green on two, five, seven, and twelve. I think it was. Um, so he's. It, this sounds very small and minor, but again, it's it's all these little things that add up over the course of a round that make the the big difference. And you're just you're just developing these sort of good habits and routines so the golfer doesn't have to think and you're just providing them and he always knows that he's sort of being you know having uh something to drink on these tea boxes or eating on these fairways again you can ask your player what they put what their preference is and what they prefer um that's that's up to you of how you do it but i, I think that's a that's a good sort of thing to introduce with your player um the other thing is uh this is a personal touch which i add which i I think I read about in a NLP book, which stands for Neuro Linguistic Programming. But basically, um, it's basically if you know if you want to develop rapport with someone, you can mirror their body language uh, uh, so that you're sort of copying them. So if if Matt on the first tee is sort of presenting a very confident body language, I want to mirror that, and I want my body language to be very confident, and you know my chest up chin up um, so that I'm giving off the same energy as he's giving and perhaps if Matt's body language is dropping throughout the day and he's you know he's having a, a rough time during the round I still want to carry that same confident body like language throughout the course of the round so that uh, he's getting a good energy and vibe off me when it matters you know, for example, if I was slouched over my bag, I, I, my shoulders were down, my head was down, I'm not really giving off um, much confidence to, to my man. I want to, you know, feel like, um, almost like Stevie Williams on the bag. It's, it's, it's a very, very confident, like, here we are, we're here to play golf, and we're here to win. That that was the, I mean, you, you, you remember Stevie, I mean, Stevie used to take off the flag uh, in playoff holes, um, when Tiger was putting uh, or the other guy was putting to indicate, well, the game's over, you know, we're going home with this flag in this tournament. 
Um, you don't have to take those extreme measures, but it's all that um, that matter of confidence which you're going to give your man uh, just through your your body language. Okay, what else do we got on here? Um, I think that's mainly the majority of it, um, which you can sort of, those are a few little objectives which you can add during your round. Oh, yeah, the yardage system. So how most of these players do their yardages, um, they would, either either they do them or you can do them. Uh, Matt would do most of his yardages, um, but the way about he did his yardages was very fascinating to me. So let's say, for example, it's a par four and he's got a second shot, 125 yards. The first thing all players will do would look at the lie of the ball. The lie of the ball indicates uh, whether it's an uphill, you know, they're adding loft to the club, or if the ball is slightly below the feet and they're de-lofting the club. Uh, that's all going to indicate how far the ball is going to go. So if the ball is slightly above your feet, the player is going to have to put a little more effort into it to get it back to that specific yardage. And then if the ball is slightly below the feet, the the club's going to be de-lofted, so it's going to come out a little stronger and a little further. So say if you had a 20, 125 yards and the ball is slightly below your feet, that's maybe maybe knock off one yard or two yards because um, you're going to add a little, you know, a stronger club to that ball. And then the next thing they'll do is they would look at the wind. What is the wind doing? Is it downwind? Is it upwind? They would chuck a piece of grass up in the air, then they would put a number on that. So it would be either uh, a plus one wind or a plus f- plus three wind or a minus four wind, meaning it's four down. Um, so you're adding all of these little, these, these notes of yardages together to give you uh, an outcome number at the end. And then the last one would be, where is the ball landing and where is it finishing? And where do you want it to finish? So if the greens are playing a little firm and hard, it could be a plus four, uh, you know, roll on the green, or it could be that, you know, the balls are spinning on the greens. They're very soft. It could be a minus four. So after you add up all of these, these, these numbers at the end, you would, um, you know, you'd have 125 yard shot and it could actually end up working to be 119 yards because of uh, the wind, the soft greens and the downhill lie of a golf ball. So I think actually Matt talks about this on his podcast episode if you want to uh, listen to that in more detail. Um, but that's that's probably sums up that and that's everything I've pretty much learned or try and implement whilst, um, whilst caddying. And the last chunk I will... Uh, basically go through my observations of what I've learnt uh, dealing with, you know, working with some of these best players around the world. And if you have any questions, feel free to email me again and I can share more insights. Let's catch you in a bit. Okay, welcome back to section number three on this last element of the trilogy of how to become a caddy on the European tour. So in this section, I'm going to be talking after. So what happens... Uh, after the the guys have finished their round of golf, how they spend their downtime, what they do in the evening, my observations of the players and what I've learnt, some specific actions you can learn and take away from this episode, and then a quick final wrap-up. Okay, so to begin with, I just actually want to touch on um, a few things I missed on the last section, and that is uh, when you're caddying, um, you're basically you're always trying to get yourself in uh, the best position so you, you're you not holding up the pace of play. So when you get up to the green, uh, it's always very important to position your bag towards the next hole. Or if you're in the fairway, you want to position your bag as if you're already sort of moving towards the next shot. It's very, very easy to get out of position, especially as you, after you've cleaned the clubs and you've put the, you put the divot back or put the club back in the bag because uh, your man's always walking ahead of you, so you always want to keep up with the pace of play. So making sure you position your bag uh, towards wherever you're going next and always looking to wherever you're going next or perhaps always having the next club ready or already having the putter head cover off is just a, a quick little tip of making making sure you're never getting out of the pace of play. The other one is uh, holding your flag for your your player. So if your player is putting out last, you want to be holding the flag. If another caddy has it, you can make a nice little gesture to him and say, I've got it from here, um, and basically taking the flag off him so that then that caddy can then be with his player and walk up towards the next tee, uh, and then vice versa if 
if you're still holding the flag and the other guy is still putting out, uh, you can hand the flag to the other caddy to make sure that you're not going to be out of pace of play. Um, caddies are very friendly amongst one another and they're always looking to help out another if someone if, if they look like you are out of the pace. So sometimes they'll offer to rake a bunker for you if, if you need to move on quickly and then you can do the same as well. So it's a very friendly atmosphere and... Um, you can take a towel towards a green is another one to make sure the ball is clean instead of just um, just licking it and just wiping it clean on your on your trousers is something I always forget, which I notice that um, players, caddies are very good at. Um, so there's just a couple of tips which you could implement during, uh, you know, if you are if you are actually taking action and being a caddy. OK, so we'll move on and basically we'll cover in this section what happens after the round. So after the final putt drops, the players will go to the score to finalise their scorecards. Caddy at this point would usually head off into the clubhouse or finish tidying up their bag uh, or their clubs to make sure they're clean if the player wants to go and practice or do some specific drills afterwards. Uh, once they've done that, I would usually go into the clubhouse, grab a cup of coffee or a drink and wait for my man at a given uh, point or a position in the clubhouse which we've agreed upon for that week and we'd usually meet there after every round and just sort of sit down with a drink and just go through uh, the round of what you know where we felt we could have done better where you know what actions we could have done uh, at different points or how we could have worked together better I remember at this last stage I was actually pulling because um, the Q school is a very long week I was pulling uh, the bag on a trolley to begin with and the way the course was set up uh, there was lots of cart paths all the way around the course so me and my player actually felt very disconnected uh, during the stage one so for the, the remaining of the round we, we made note of that and I was going to be carrying which is not a problem and I actually prefer it um, because we felt a little bit disconnected and I can be more by his side uh, instead of sort of walking down the cart paths. So it's little things like that uh, where you're trying to f figure out how the week's going and what you can do to improve. After that, if, if, if the player doesn't want to do any drills, we would usually go and head back to the villa or apartments, pick up some food from a local supermarket and go back to the house and cook up uh, something for the evening or lunch the next day so that we have food ready. If it was a particularly good day, we may head out into the local town and meet up with some other players, grab something to eat and maybe get a glass of wine. Uh, it's very, very friendly and relaxed. Um, in the evenings, uh, the player would probably sit in the living room and just do some stretching while could be watching a movie or listening to a podcast. The movies we've included watching over the years have been Shinner's List and Billy Madison. So it's all very, very friendly and it's uh, it's it's a pretty cool way to live, I would say. Um and it's a great way to explore, you know, areas uh, around the world if you if you can get out in the evenings. Um, OK, so things like cooking, uh, what kind of things they cook? I would say this is one area which golfers could probably improve on the most. Uh, I've seen things from like, you know, very simple carbohydrates such as white bread and Nutella to high carbohydrate and refined cereals such as Frosties and Cheerios. It's kind of all junk and and especially when players are putting so much hard work into their game and developing their swing and all their um, you know, techniques and then they forget this element of the game which I think could be the most important thing out of all of them is how you feel out on the golf course. And I've done lots of sort of work in this area um, looking at performance nutrition, nutrition diets, having done sort of Ironman and other sort of athletic ventures so I would my recommendations would be to focus on getting your primary food from whole foods such as such as meats fishes um, uh, getting your energy from sources of fats rather than carbohydrates so if you up the fat in the diet such as uh, avocado oils nuts full fat yogurt instead of zero percent fat a uh, full fat cream or full fat uh, dairy instead of semi skimmed, uh, you're going to be far better off in getting a better fuel of energy than relying on simple, plain carbohydrates such as white bread, oatmeal, bananas, um, which are going to spike your insulin and give you this sort of tidal wave or ride of a 
of energy levels throughout the course of the day. Uh, again, if you want to email me on that, I can sort of give you lots of recommendations of, of what to eat if you're interested. Uh, there's another a great guy who I used to follow called Charles Poliquin, sadly died this year, but he used to say, get your, your proteins from things such that have eyes that flies or that runs, I think is a good rule of thumb as well to add in. Okay, so that covers that sort of section. Uh, on this sort of penultimate bit, I'm going to s- sort of talk about what are the, some of the best lessons I've learned whilst working with these players. So by far, the biggest difference I've noticed between professional golf uh, to the top amateurs um, I've played with is that these these professionals are such good drivers of the golf ball. I think out of the 30 plus rounds I've done this for, uh, with three players in each group, I've seen probably two balls go out of bounds for that whole given time. They are all hitting it phenomenally straight and phenomenally long and giving themselves the very best opportunity to score from the middle of the fairway um, as they possibly can. And that seems it seems very apparent across the field. Um, all of these golfers are sort of six foot plus now. They're all uh, very tall, lean, mean, athletic athletes. And, you know, the little short guys are not going to be around much longer, I don't think, in this game. All these guys at Q School are are athletes. They're not, they're not guys who, you know, they're guys who are would have been playing baseball or basketball or doing like rowing and they're now entering the sport of golf so either you're going to be left behind if you're hitting it sort of 240 250 all over the place um because you, you just can't keep up with a guy who's pounding it 300 plus down the middle of the fairway and just coming with a flick wedge every uh every other hole so um i would say that's the biggest highlighter for me uh, even the old guys are uh, have huge range of motions, big turns on their backswing and still getting out there for, uh, you know, a long way. So that was the biggest highlighter of me. Um, I wouldn't say they're short game or I'm player. I would just definitely say uh, they're driving. And then from there on in, they, they can work with what they've got. Uh, the other note is that I don't think there are any self-made players or as a belief I have. Um, all of these golfers surround themselves with very, uh, of the best coaches in very specific parts of their game. So they would be looking for the best putting coach and then they would be looking for the best um, mental or or sports um, conditioning coach. And then they'd be looking for a a technical coach Um, and they're looking for the best guy in the industry uh, for each metric of the game. And they're surrounding themselves with great coaches. So if you've got one coach seeing and working your whole game, that may be fine. It, you know, it does work for some players, but I, I think the the more the more I speak to these guys, the more they are surrounding themselves with a, a, a whole team of people rather than uh, just one man um, or woman. Um, they are on another observation of these pros. I would say they are a resilient bunch, and they all have this sort of growth mindset. So. Um, if you want to look at more information on this, you could look up uh, a couple of books. One's called um, Growth Mindset by Carol Dweck, who is a Stanford professor. The other one is, I think, Matthew Syed, the author of Bounce. And he wrote a new, great new little book, which I'd recommend called You Are Awesome. It's targeted at kids, but you can sit down with a cup of coffee and uh, read it in an afternoon. And... I'm actually featuring two new guests uh, on on the podcast, hopefully in the new year. One's called Josh Kaufman, who just written a new book. I've actually just finished it this afternoon called How to Fight a Hydra. And that's a, f- a really interesting uh, little book of how to conquer your fears. And you could also look at Dave Orrid's work, The Pressure Principle, uh, is another fantastic resource. So a couple of the resources there which can help sort of with that growth mindset and your resilience, which is another sort of core fundam- fundamental uh, attribute, I'd say, all of these players seem to have. Touching on Dave Orrid's book, uh, I think we had Dave Orrid on episode sort of 12, I think it was, um, one of the more popular episodes of the podcast. And I was reading his book out in Spain and he did a great illustration. Uh, I've forgotten what chapter it is, but um, he talks about, you know, when you're first learning to write, you know, learn how to 
to to drive drive a car and you're you're trying to process all of this information to get the thing going. So you've got to put your seatbelt on, you've got to turn it on, you've got to engage the clutch, uh, put the accelerator on, and then use the handbrake. All of this, all of these def- these skills are running through your head at a thousand miles an hour for you just to move it. But then two, three years down the line, all of a sudden you can just get in your car, turn it on, and before you know it, you're at your end destination. And golf is very much like that. You're always learning um, all these new skills and then over the course of time they become sort of unconscious and I know players like Matt Wallace is very very good at this he will actually reach out to people like Paul Dunn or Shane Lowry and if he sees them hitting uh, a great shot in a very specific way I know having spoken to him he will actually go out and reach out to these specific players and he'll say how do you mind if you ask you know how how did you play it in that way and then those players will then share their insights and little tips or strategies with Matt and then he's sort of he's always increasing his knowledge base um, and then you know before you know it three years down the line you are this great driver and not the driver you were once uh, when you first started to learn how a car but and the same with golf you you used to play a chip shop in a very basic way and now you've got sort of five different options you can play around the greens in in very specific ways because you've learned those skills having spoken to other players and I know uh, Matt Perry the guy I always caddy with he hit a very special shot at one stage at Q school once with these very floppy hands in this thick rough and it came out very very softly and landed to about an inch uh, next to the hole I was like wow how did you play that or that that looked really strange and he said yeah um funny story I didn't know how I was stuck with this shot for years and then I actually reached out to Michael Campbell uh, the winner of the US Open and he told me how to play it and you know in a, in a very specific way so always be uh learning and yearning to increase your skill base to the next level okay what else have we got here um, I think as a caddy, uh, the, the biggest thing I've learned is that golf is a series of decision making. And what I mean by this is that when you're when you're trying to produce a round to, of golf together uh, for a good score, it basically comes down to um, lots of series of decisions. And uh, a good way of describing it is, is like um, there's a Warren Buffett, if you never heard of him, is one of the wealthiest people in the world, and he just he's he he owns a hedge fund called Berkshire Hathaway, and he describes his analogy of investing when it comes to buying a new business as like a baseballer going up to the stand and um and what balls he chooses to to hit or invest in. So a baseball player doesn't have to. Uh, doesn't have to swing at every ball that comes all he has to do is just keep waiting for that perfect ball or that perfect pitch to come and when it comes he can swing really hard and knock it out the ballpark Um, and golf is like that analogy so you're always sort of just trudling along hitting the fattest part of the, the fairways fattest part of the greens if a putt drops it drops you move on and then when a perfect opportunity does arise you take advantage of it you go straight at the pin you play a little bit more aggressively and then you go back to sort of trudling along um fat parts of fairways fat parts of greens taking your percentages Uh, It takes just as much skill hitting it 15 feet away from the pin as it does to the pin. So um, becoming very patient and deliberate with how you're playing the game and reducing risk all the time until the perfect opportunity does come and present itself and then you take advantage of it. Um, Another analogy is when Dr. Bob Rattel used to work with Darren Clark, he used to describe the system as a as like a traffic light so you have green light orange light and then a red light Uh, green light is when um, you know it could be like a a very easy par five and you want to play a little more aggressively or a short par four that's easily drivable with no trouble around the green and you can take on that 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 pin and an orange light may be just a, a good a good par four and then a red light would be um one where like a pin has been put in a sucker position where you wouldn't even 
dream of you know attempting to go for and you hit it deliberately 30 feet away and you take your two putts and get out of there so if you can see it that way and see golf more like a chess match and moving the ball around like a prawn and a king around the course and leaving it the right side of the holes and taking your opportunities when they come i think it will serve you well um okay so on to the final element of this podcast and it's been quite a long one i hope you're still here with me um so this is the actions you can take uh from this whole episode so i think from from this whole series of notes and lessons learned i would say the 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 best thing you can do and implement is is to have this desire of to never stop learning and growing within the game of golf so there's an author coming up in the new year who I'm going to try and feature on the podcast called James Clear and his new book called Atomic Habits. Atomic Habits, sorry. And he talks about the sort of a system-based approach to achieving your success rather than setting goals. So I'll give you a couple of examples. If you're a coach, your goal might be to win uh, a championship. Your system is the way you recruit players, manage your assistant coaches and conduct practice sessions. If you're an entrepreneur, your goal might be to build a a million dollar company. Your system is how to test product ideas, hire employees, run marketing campaigns, make sales phone calls or or make 10 sales phone calls a day. If you're a musician, your goal might be to play a new piece. Your system is often how you practice, how you break down and tackle difficult measures and your method to receiving feedback from your instructor. And I'll give you one more, which um, I quite like is if you're if you want to become a New York Times best-selling author, your goal would be to become a New York Times best-selling author and your system would be to write two pages a day. So you're basically breaking up uh, your your end destination of where you want to be with specific measurements of basically turning up every day and every day. And if you do that in the long run, your goals will take care of themselves. But you're more obsessed with the focus of the process rather than the outcome. So what does that mean? It basically means, you know, stop being the golfer who plays just during the summer months and hopes to get his handicap down. Instead, hit 50 balls a day with your with your short game clubs. If you do that, your handicap in the summer is going to come down. You're going to have a greater chance of winning, you know, uh, a weekly medal or your club championships or whatever it be. Uh, if you spend another system could be... Uh, work with your coach once a week uh, that is a good system so every once a week I will always work with my coach uh, I'll hit 100 balls with him or something like that or if you want to get fit and healthy if you want to drop 10 pounds then your system would be to run three times a week and if you do that the end goal will take care of itself okay so I think that sums everything up i hope you enjoyed this new style of format uh, if, if you did feel free to email me at making a club champion at gmail.com or you can head over to the website making a club champion.com and reach me on there um, i hope you enjoyed these podcasts if you do just let me know i'd love to hear from you and what perhaps your goals are with your game uh, where you want to take it where you want to go where you want to be uh, i'd love to hear from you personally uh, perhaps that's what your favorite podcast is or something like that or perhaps you have a new uh, a guest in mind which you'd like to feature me on the show whatever it is let me know and i'll do my very best to make it happen um i think this may be it for 2018 i've been so i've really enjoyed it again some amazing uh new guests and uh, we've had a good time so hopefully lots of new experiences and great podcast episodes to share with you in the new year uh, stay strong never keep learning never keep learning Keep learning (laughs) and keep growing. I'll catch you soon. Bye-bye.